Welcome back for another episode of Full Steam Ahead, where we discuss all things STEM, but with a twist of art. Our goal is to encourage the next generation of STEM leaders, bring our experiences to life, and encourage you to reach your full potential. Yo, 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 welcome back to another episode of Full Steam Ahead. Really great to see y'all. Today we have Matt Shar and a very special guest joining us. Um, shout out to everything that she's done for the STEM, STEAM community. Um, shout out to all the time that she's put in Nesby. This is some, someone that I personally uh, have known for years, someone that I'm very excited to have on the show. Uh, looking forward to this conversation and looking forward to the things that she's just doing in the future. Uh, so let me just give you all some brief background and give you uh, just a little bit of a bio. Uh, Dr. Sosina Wood is a presidential postdoctoral fellow within the biomedical engineering department at Carnegie Mellon University. She is furthering her research experience in neuroimaging under the guidance of Professor Jana Kaner Storfer. Dr. Wood is focused on developing and designing medical devices that detect neurological damage and or diseases. And Professor Kaner Storfer is a leader in non-invasive optics imaging that monitors disease. At the end of her fellowship, she intends to become a tenure work research faculty member. Dr. Wood completed her PhD in bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh under the guidance of Professor Tamer S. Ibrahim in 2018 and was a K. Leroy Irvis Fellow, National Gym Consortium, PhD Fellow, Pitt Strive Fellow, and received Pitt's Provost Development Fund. She received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in 2011 and believes the platform of her success sprung from the Pitt Excel program. Dr. Wood's dissertation work was featured in more than eight peer-reviewed journal articles, 32 international abstracts, five international talks, and a segment of NBC Learn. Dr. Wood is one of the University of Pittsburgh's Rising African American Leaders Awardee, National Institutes of Health F31 Awardee, New Pittsburgh Couriers Fab 40 Awardee, Nesby's 2017 Mike Shin Distinguished Member of the Year, the Female Awardee, and Professional Women's Network Awardee. So Cena served two terms as national chairperson of the National Society of Black Engineers, as well as other leadership roles within the organization. While committed to advancing neurological health, so Cena is also committed to engaging and empowering underrepresented youth to pursue STEM degrees locally and globally. So let's welcome Dr. Sosina Wood. Ooh, thank you for having me. We do claps. Let's go. Let's go. Let's move into um, our main topic: uh, navigating the steam, navigating through the steam. Sorry, and yeah. the reason why I, you know, wanted to title it that uh, is because you know, as as a woman, as a black woman in in steam, as I said earlier in the show. You've done a lot for the community, um, for the STEM world, um, you know, just just Nesby period, and even else outside of that. Uh, and it, I'm sh I'm sure it wasn't easy. I can't I can't even I can what's the word? Is it empathize or sympathize? I can empathize. Emp well, it empathize. depends on how you feel it, but yeah. Hey, I can empathize with what mm -hmm. what you've gone through, but you know, nobody's nobody's journey is exactly the same. So, um, you know, I want you to talk a little with us about your experience. And uh, so first we can, we can talk about, you know, what, what inspired you to go into, into STEM? Uh, like what was that first defining moment that made you say, okay, I want to go into engineering. Yeah. Maybe my story actually might be perfect for, you know, the, uh, the purpose of the podcast. So I wanted to be an artist. Um, I wanted to draw and uh, my mom said, you know, they don't make no money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that being said, as I got older, you know, just teaching me things like learning that I really like math, which I love math. And um, she was the first one that told me who someone was that designed gadgets. I had a fascination with gadgets. I wanted to be like a little spy girl. I had the girl talk, disguise your voice and the little, you know, things that you go around. I was like really nosy trying to uh, 
copying off of my sister and whatever she did. So I had all these gadgets and I wanted to be someone that designed gadgets. So she said, that's an electrical engineer. And those words stuck. And um, I think back to what my father used to do, like little science projects. He would always do them with me. Um, so both of them together really kind of nurtured this environment for me to create, make things. Um, if there was like little pieces of wood around the house and for whatever reason, I wanted to make a car, whatever broke down car I was making, um, <laughs> they offered a, a platform for us to do that. So um, yeah, my parents were the people who uh, put me on this path. And I would say from like fifth grade, once my mom told me what electrical engineer was, I wrote an essay, I stuck with it. But it was because of the opportunities that I was allowed to have um, for me to continue to, to learn what electrical engineering was. Okay, cool. That's um, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, and so were your were your parents engineers? No, um, my mom nurse and my dad a pharmacist. Okay, got you. So you were you were still seeing getting some size of STEM though from your from your dad being a pharmacist, your mom being a nurse. Um, they still knew to you know, push that narrative to some extent. Is, is that correct? Or mm, yeah, I would say so. I don't, I don't think that they were trying to like force a career on us. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember at a time kind of telling my mom like, Hey, I want to be a nurse like you. And she said, no, baby, you want to be a doctor. They make the money. And I'm like, wait, why, why can't I be a nurse like you? Like, What's wrong with that? <laughs> um, but you know, like nothing, nothing like overbearingly, like you have to be a lawyer, you have to be this. Um, so right. I could say like, if we told them about something, they, they simply took it and exposed, it, exposed us to that. So if it was sports and I was into sports, we got to go to sports camp, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got you. Um, so I know when, did you plan on going to, uh, Univer University of Pittsburgh was that like your your dream school or what? How'd you how'd you get there? Yeah, scholarship. And okay. um, <laughs> <no, laughs> absolutely not. So the funny story behind that, I did not know that Pittsburgh was in the mountains, and I did not know that Pittsburgh received snow. So I applied to schools that were down south: um, applied to Spelman, Georgia Tech, North Carolina State, uh, University of Miami. Everywhere I applied was down south, except for Pitt because they were the one school that was given a free waiver, like, hey, you know, come apply to us, we'll pay your waiver. And then once they paid the waiver, and it's like, ooh, you get a scholarship that's like half tuition. So I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm looking at them in comparison to the other schools that I got into. Um, and so really that's, that's what made my decision. Um, at the time I was running track and field, so I was also looking at schools that if I were to work on, um, who would be, you know, a place that I could be, you know, potentially compete and get uh, money from that avenue as well. So uh, it was all about the money, you know, especially, you know, not being the only child. It was all about the money. So. Got you. I understand that. That's, um, mm -hmm. you said you, I, didn't, I didn't know you ran track. Yep. You said you were the only child or you, or you aren't? I am not. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there are four of us. I am the second to last. Oh, the money running so, out by the end. The first two ran it up. <laughs> That's true. Did they did they go to uh Pitt as well or mm -mm. Okay. Um so both of my sisters went to HBCUs. Um my brother did as well, so I'm the only one that did oh, it. Oh man, you should have came. Okay, in. got you. I tried. Spelman cost too much, Spelman. though. I was like, yeah. I was about to Spelman, too, but they were out of my budget, and they kept misspelling my name. Even though I kept correcting it on the form, they kept misspelling my name. And I'm like, I ain't cool. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, so if you don't mind me asking, which HBCUs did your, did your brother and your sisters go to? Um, one of my sisters went to University of Maryland, uh, Eastern Shore. Okay. Uh, the, the other one, I can't say the name uh, correctly, but it's in Alabama. Starts with a T. Tuskegee? Um, no, not Tuskegee. Uh, it's another one. Uh, um, it's like Oh, Talladega. I can't say it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so she went there. Um, then my brother went to uh, Johnson C. Smith as well as Morgan. Okay. okay. In Charlotte and Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And my parents, they went to HBCUs too. So, oh yeah. man, you missed one. out. I'm out. I did. I did. 
It's Dang. okay. You walked a different path. Well, I mean, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Everybody's path is different. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Did, were you about to say something? Nah, nah. Hey, the PWI has need some oh. representation too. So. Hey, do. Um, yep. So, in in regard to your the research that you're currently um, taking part in, um, which neurological which neurological <laughs> diseases are you looking to detect? And do you notice any trends with uh, diseases in minorities? Yes. Um, so I'll speak on one that I'm, I'm working on now. And I, I picked up the, uh, the disorder from working in my, my doctoral work. So sickle cell disease, mm. um, you know, it's a, it's a blood disorder that's more prominent against African-Americans mm -hmm. or those of African descent or Mediterranean descent. So I've been working um, with people who happen to may have that disorder. The nice part of it is you get to develop technology that directly impacts us. Um, but there are other disorders that I've also worked in. Um, so I work with people who happen to have small vessel disease, um, schizophrenia, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, one trend that you do see, and um, Alzheimer's somehow happens to have melanin as some type of attraction. Um, so I don't know the full details of that, but uh, yeah, melanin is something that uh, for some reason, people who have Alzheimer's, there's some, there's some connection with that. So I don't know the whole biology beyond that, but I will say that. Um, so I'm looking to branch out more so uh, studying more vascular diseases, um, you know, so that like diabetes or what have you, um, they also have neural effects. So how can I, I use that, develop the technology, you know, specifically to look at how the blood vessels happen to um, have different type of impacts on the brain. So whether it's uh, cognition or, you know, lack of oxygen, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting because uh, yeah. I've heard a tie between diabetes and Alzheimer's and it's got to do with the, you know, the blood flow and all that stuff. But they did some studies mm -hmm. about that too. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, yep. black people, a lot of black people do get diet, you know, they do have diabetes. And then if there's a mm -hmm. connection with melanin with, the, you said dementia? Uh, yeah, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's yeah. interesting how they could be linked. Yeah. So, so the, the like, like we know from having family who happen to have diabetes or, you know, close family members. But um, as far as just like that correlation being out there, it's not as strong. Um, so not to say that there isn't any evidence that's there, it's there, but it's just not as strong. Can I ask, what was gotcha. your, your major for the PhD? Bioengineering. Bioengineering, okay. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. is this what you did your dissertation research on? Uh, what you right now? Not fully. Yeah, not fully. So my dissertation research was more so out of, um, I work with ultra high field uh, MRIs, which is the next evolution of MRIs to hit the hospital. Um, phenomenal resolution, just the challenges that with such high intensity that you can see, you can potentially burn people's tissues. So we were creating the uh, helmets that go around people. Like when you go on a scanner, you put like these helmets on that can see within the body. Uh, we were developing that and I was doing a lot of the RF safety um, as well as thermal like testing around that. So mine was more so in quality assurance, like how can you make this technology work so that it is actually beneficial. Um, but alongside of it, I didn't write the dissertation on that, but like working with the patient. So taking the technology, working with the clinicians and um, being able to you know, continue to have studies and have findings. So. I was one of the main people working with patients and that's kind of why I pivoted to having more of direct work working with patients because I enjoyed it. So, you know, hearing people's stories and different type of things they face and you can actually make technology that's impactful. Like that's me. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What kind of, uh, Thank you. what drew you to the, like you mentioned, uh, Alzheimer's and schizophrenia. I guess sickle cell is kind of, different from those two in that category but is there anything specific that kind of like mm -hmm. made you want to pick those subjects no it was more so like who wanted to collaborate with my advisor um and just being in a, a space to you know learn about those different disorders um and the different type of ways that they come up with these testing uh to actually see improve 
are there different findings in someone who doesn't have the d disease versus someone who does? So um, just learning about that is more so a learning experience. I didn't have direct influence over that. Yeah, so hopefully in the latter part, you know, when I become a professor, I can, can choose who I collaborate okay. with. Right. So uh, I know, I kind of know the process. I went through the PhD process. I did the postdoc also. Uh, so I'm wondering like with uh, grant writing, right? Because a lot of times your research is dictated on how you get funding. So have you had challenges with getting funding? Because, right, you're, you're talking about a very specific demographic, very specific uh, studies and, 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 and diseases. So, like, are you having difficulties finding, you know, someone to fund what it is you want to actually look at? <laughs> yeah, so I won't say I'm having problems. I will say more so right now, it's at least being in a position position to do so. So um, I moved from MRI to actually doing MRI with NAR, spectroscopy and EEG. So how can I combine different types of technologies together? So my first year of my postdoc was pretty much learning all over again, like some different type of technology. Um, and so I've been in the place of building preliminary work before I actually like really apply to some of these grants. Um, but I'm also in the midst of applying to faculty applications yeah. right now. So, you know, actually applying for funding um, is on hold. So I hope not, but um, hopefully within NIH, you know, there's some funding that, you know, people will find it attractive. But you know how that yeah. is. Like, they might like your idea and say, this is nice, but not right now. If you, um, yeah. I, I, I'm putting in a plug here. So I, I work for Washington, okay. Washington, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and they have a big uh, medical school. And so I'm not sure, and we do have a, a bioengineering school. And so I'm not sure if it's faculty openings, but the engineering program, we do have a, a, a drive to produce more. I'm on the diversity and inclusion board here. So they, there's a push okay. to get more diverse okay. uh, faculty members. So uh, it would be cool. You could apply even to like a school like this. It's a private institution. Uh, but it, I think it is more marketable uh, to have grant money uh, already coming in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you already got the funding coming in. Yeah. I do think it's more marketable that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I'll, uh, I'll check. I'll check you all yeah. out. I'm not, no, I'm not um, sure. Yeah, the, you definitely have a good reputation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the um, what research they do, because a lot of times it depends on what they kind of already do. I do think with you doing mm -hmm. uh, with your research, emphasis and then with your bioengineering you can apply to engineering schools and medical schools to be faculty i feel like yep. your research area you, you're very uh you're marketable like where you can go into both yeah yeah where you can do both so i think you can i think you have a lot of opportunities it just depends on which one and which school is the best fit for you because a lot of times the parents are looking for a very specific research because they're usually, they're usually lacking yeah. in the area so they're usually looking for faculty to fill that area that they feel like they need more uh, emphasis in. One um one that that brings me to a good point, Char. So, like Char was saying, there's a like a crossover there. How does how did you get from electrical engineering to um to bio biomedical engineer? Like I I know that you know it's I, I don't know a whole lot about biomedical engineer. I know that there's you know, there's some people who make prosthetics and things of that nature. And that's all I, I really know. But how did you link the two? Because, you know, most most electrical engineers, they go into like power, power delivery or, um, you know, electronics and things of that nature. Um, how did you how did you have the foresight to say, OK, I'm going to do electrical engineers and then I'm going to go into biomedical engineering? Because, I mean, it, it makes sense to me that now that you're you're building devices, um, you know, uh, and designing mm -hmm. devices to detect um, neurological diseases, but I wouldn't have had the foresight to to think, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna make this shift real quick and then do that. So I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, um, I think a, a lot of experiences that I have is uh, one, just having the right mentors and, and having conversations with people who, who've done it, you know, to kind of give you guidance along the way. Um, so I, I, I actually didn't want to get a PhD um, if it wasn't for some of my mentors who, who put that into me as far as like, this is a route that you should consider and you should go. I definitely wasn't trying to stay in school any longer because I'm like, hey, I could halfway finish electrical engineering. Why are you trying to make me go get a right. PhD? Um, so the switch 
switch I made, um, I realized that rather than at the time developing technology such as, you know, iPhones or what have you, I didn't feel like that was impactful. I thought it was cool, you know, automated cars. I thought that was cool, you know, voice automation and stuff like that, but I didn't feel like it had a real impact. And so um, I had a few projects that you got to intertwine um, biomedical engineering, such as uh, with MATLAB, make an artificial pacemaker with a, uh, a digital signal processing board. You know, so can you uh, simulate the radio frequency waves and its effect on the, the pacemaker that you built? Um, so something like that. I was like, oh, okay. And then the advisor that I actually worked with, um, I did a summer research program with him. So that allowed me to see through different classes and things like this is really what I really wanted mm -hmm. to do. Um, I had worked for a company ANSYS um, that does, you know, like simulation software, and mechanics and things. ANSYS? And I saw kind of A N S Y S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I worked with them for like a year and uh, did kind of like the software building side. And I said, okay, like this is neat, but this isn't for me. Um, worked for a company called PowerCast, which did wireless power, kind of wireless power charging. And they were doing that before it became a thing in the stores. Um, so I saw that that was cool, but, you know, I didn't feel like that was exactly me. So once I learned more about biomedical engineering, um, talk to people, said, you know, is this something that I can actually do? Will I do it and will I fail? You know, that's like the, the true question that everybody wants to ask. And um, it was the department chair at the time, Harvey Borovitz, who told me like, absolutely, I think you're fine. But uh, the expectations that I'll have of you is that most of our students have a high GPA at 3.7. And I didn't have that in undergrad. So I'm like, oh, Lord, <laughs> what am I about to get into? So you know, it worked, it, it worked out for me. It was a smooth transition. Um, definitely some challenges around the way, but it was smooth. Yeah. I, I remember, um, when I reached out to you one time to get help with MATLAB when I was in my, um, my master's program, um, cause MATLAB can be a bit yeah. punching the wrong, punching the one wrong digit. Your whole code is thrown off. Yeah. I, used to I, hated I, MATLAB. Did MATLAB. I did MATLAB for my dissertation too. I don't know. I found it so easy. Mm -mm. After I got it though, after, <laughs> after I got it, look, look like we not smart at all. No, 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 no. After I got it, like I didn't get it forever, right? And then it just clicked, and now I'm just like, oh man, this is great. Yeah. No, that's when I knew, like, I didn't want to do coding or anything like that. Just that little taste of MATLAB. MATLAB. Um, a lot of people now. argue that MATLAB isn't even real, like coding. Coding, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think know. it's so user friendly. Yeah, it is. But is it? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's it's cool. I mean, but is I I don't know if I would say it's user friendly. I mean, you have to, when you try to build a loop or you try to like have you ever tried to build a loop inside of a yes. loop and then yes. you try to do a four dimensional inside of another or, loop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then, okay, but then when you step, when you accidentally step outside of one of your loops too soon, it just crashes the whole thing. I feel like that to me, that's not user friendly. Like, but that's part of. I think you had too many. But that's loops. part of coding. I mean, because really, coding is really just kind of is is deep is the debugging, right? Okay, so, making sure. It mm -hmm. works. I guess we we would need Sabrill for this to know what technical user user friendly is but uh, i mean okay. it's it's cool i mean i guess i guess that makes sense like coding itself is not necessarily like it it, it might not be user friendly. i don't know i don't i don't know how to do java or anything like that matlab probably is as far as matlab and excel probably as far as i can go as far as coding and stuff I use, like that i, I just use know excel too. huh I use you excel use excel too. now yeah i do use that too because you can code in excel like when I do my oh. grading, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. literally set my grades as if then statements and I just can hit the little button. Yeah, oh. I, I do that too for, for work. Yeah, you used to yes. I discovered a, a new I discovered a um a new formula not too long ago and I felt like I was on top of the world. Yeah. Um, I do all kinds of codings for uh Excel. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, I wanna uh hop back to Cecilia's story real quick. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like there's a few good gems in there that a lot of people need to like hear. Okay, the, I wanted to say something too. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. <laughs> the the first one was uh, you know get a mentor, right? Yes. She said I wasn't really sure about my path, but I had some great mentors that kind of helped me step my way through. Like that's that's awesome. Uh, number two, I'm glad you didn't just like 
take the easy way out and, you know, you finish your electrical engineering degree and, you know, you could have gone off and just took a job and, and done that. But you said, you know, I want to find something with a little more purpose and something I'll be more passionate about, like, and contribute to, like, society. And so you went a little deeper and with that next step. And now you, you know, biomedical, PhD, whatever, and <laughs> making stuff happen. I think, um, I think that's awesome and important Crazy. for people to, like, hear, especially up and comers. So good stuff. Yeah. Uh, another jam, yeah. another jam was the summer inter the summer research internship, the summer programs. Those are so monumental, to, I think, to me. With everyone I know who goes to graduate school, get a PhD, I think we've all had some kind of summer program that kind of changed our lives or really helped us get the funding or help us make that networking or those connections. So I agree. The mentorship, yeah. the summer program, and then finding something that you will enjoy working and doing yeah. are, are, are yeah. like the key three things that she said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's definitely true. Uh, Cause I, I was going to ask if those were intern, those were internships. Cause you were like, I was doing this. I was doing that. I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> because. Oh, that, oh, resume, that resume is intimidating, baby. <laughs> she, she got a list. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, and 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 another thing. So one thing I I wanted to touch on with all of that, with all of your your research that you're doing and in the in the work that you're doing, how do you maintain a healthy work life balance? You know, that's that's a tough question for me because I feel like it's an ever evolving mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you get to a point, even in your life, whether it's outside, inside work, or whatever, you get to a point like something is always changing. Um, and in ways, for me, that's good because it means that I'm always challenged, right? right? So um, I could say I'm not the best at it. Um, I'm definitely someone, like, when I'm really in it, I'm in it, you know? So you need to find a way to tap out. And so for research, it took me a very long time to understand, especially with programming stuff. You don't need to program <laughs> to the wee hours at night. Like, you can tap out and, and do that, you know, the next day. So um, I would say for me, Actually, maybe this is a good thing for people to hear too. Um, I had shingles at 25. Wow. And um, I had that uh, not really knowing from all the stress that I was putting mm -hmm. on my body. So, you know, you be 21, right? And whatever, undergrad, you can stay up all night. When you start getting a little older, your body starts to age and you just can't keep up with that. Like you can't drink caffeine and all those different types of things. So actually, when I applied to um, get my F31 award from NIH, uh, I remember my, my advisor was like, hey, you know, you should apply for this. I think you got a good chance, but it's something you should do right away. And I'm like, right now, I um, was finishing up all of my classes as far as my coursework um, in my PhD program. And I was getting ready to present one of my researches uh, abroad for the first time in Italy. And I was training my second board for NSBE. And I remember that entire April, that entire April, I was not sleeping. I was probably averaging like three to four hours of sleep. And um, my hair started wow. falling out. So I got this, you know, thick hair. My hair started falling out and I really didn't realize why. So I'm just like, oh, okay, maybe it's breaking it off. And it broke off so much that, you know, at first I had a friend, I stayed with her in New York before I went to uh, Italy. And she was like, girl, your hair all over the place. And I'm like, yeah, it's breaking off. But not realizing until I came back from Italy and I had like these marks on my back. Mm. So, you know, black people automatically like, you know, you've been here, you've been there. You know, you got bed bugs. I'm like, I don't think I got bed bugs. Put some you got bed on it. <laughs> So I go to the doctor and the doctor was like, you have shingles. And so uh, they said, we, we've been seeing a lot of people your age that are young um, lately. It could be finals. It could be whatever, but you have shingles. And so that was the first lesson for me, even though it wasn't like a serious mm -hmm. outbreak. It was just like one or two. Those little one or two spots hurt me mm. so bad. It's just like even my clothes touching me, it just hurt. So that was my first lesson that, okay, like you cannot be this out of balance, not going to sleep and everything. Like you're not a robot. As much as you like to think you're a robot, you're not a robot. You got to put yourself on the structure. There are certain things that have to be done within a certain time, you know, so, you know, when that's, you know, they had 
also it's a conference yeah. call. I don't need to be on every conference call. Like here are the specific things I need to be in, you know? So just kind of like trying to find and optimize your time. And I feel like once you kind of get a structure, you can get that going for a few years, but then something changes and, you know, it's different. Right. So with my postdoc, um, for me, it has been just choosing the hours that I would work, you know, not feeling like I have to work until whatever type of hour time I feel like I'm done. You know, it's just learning like, okay, you can get this done and then move on to the next right. thing. You need to set boundaries. Um, and just trying to get that. Yeah, set boundaries. Exactly. Set boundaries. Um, conversations that you have with people. Um, boundaries even into fact, letting, know, letting people know where your office is. <laughs> so... I know people know me from a variety of different things. I do not advertise outside of you have my email. I don't advertise where my office is because I know that students would come in, you know, and they would come in frequently. Mm -hmm. And that is something that would disrupt me from what I need to do. So unless we were just having a conversation, I will meet you elsewhere. I'm not going to meet you in my office because I know that's, that's a place that you would come to, you know. So, yeah, it's just like different things. I feel like as you evolve, as you grow, you learn yourself in a, a different type right. of way. But um, always like health is always important. Yeah. I had to cut and off my email notifications. <laughs> I cut mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Social media, too. Oh, oh I didn't have to cut them off. off. <laughs> but like, I guess, yeah. but like you said, you get consumed with work. So I had to I had to cut off the email notifications. It's not urgent. When I see the email, I'll check it it's, and I'll respond in. It's not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's so, not. And, and it's really, um, especially like right now in this COVID-19 setting, it, and everybody's or a lot of people working from home, it's very easy to overwork. Like I find myself really having to give myself a, a hard cut off and I still don't really abide by it. Like it's really easy because it's like you're already at home. All you got to do is walk across the hallway or go downstairs or whatever, or upstairs, whatever it is for you is really, it's really easy to overwork. And I know that, yeah. um, you know, with Nesby, like even just being, I was the highest I've went in Nesby was, you know, chapter president, you know, um, chapter president A&T. And I did a couple, uh, alumni chapters in Tulsa and, and Arkansas. Um, but I know that national on the national level, that's that, you know, that that's even crazier. So like, how did how did how did that approach you? I know you said you know you got real stressed at a certain point, um, and like you just mentioned. But how did how did Nesby affect you studying for your classes? Um, you know, in both undergrad and grad school. Like how did how did it affect you? And you know, how did it approach how you did your research as well? Yeah, I, I think it actually helped. You know. Um, I would say because it was something to keep structure with your time. I've, I've always been somebody that has done something. So whether it's sports or whatever, you find you find ways to, to basically not waste mm -hmm. your time. Um, so I felt like an undergrad, it was helpful. Uh, it was nice having peers around you when you could and just kind of keep in balance. Um, uh, yeah, undergrad, I think it helped. Um, graduate school, I think it was more of a challenge because you're expected to be in a lab, you know, for an extensive amount of time, whatever that time is. Um, I was the only um, American in my lab. So just that culture of international students are, you know, kind of seen, unfortunately, I think it's unfair mm -hmm. that they're in the lab more, like that's consumable. And so then you feel like you got to be there 24 seven. So true. I think, you know, just that's optics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're always there. You know, and I think that's a bad thing that the school doesn't kind of put in balance with We that. actually right. had someone who used to shower on campus because there was a shower, like a, it was like, it was mm -hmm. random, but we had a lab, but in the basement, it was showers. And he literally used to sleep in his office and shower on, on campus. And I'm like, this cannot be life. Mm -mm. I'm like, I'm, I'm, and it's yeah, like, it's yeah, it's like I'm not competing with it. No, not at all. So yeah, just um, just just optics, just learning um, and, and having hard conversations, you know, with my advisor at the time, you know, just him feeling at the time like, hey, maybe this is, is this your main thing? And I'm like, absolutely not. But if that is your perception of me, which is good to have that evaluation, we can have a discussion of how I can change things. So, you know, uh, I think once we had that hard conversation and steered things, it, it was for the better for the both of us. So do you feel, do you feel like being those years that you were uh, either regional chair or, or national chair, do you feel like it 
I mean, it of course took away from you know your your personal time and stuff like that. Did it? It did it at all? Um, I don't know the right way to say. It. Did it all make you better, or did it did it make you do things differently? Yeah, um, I think uh, without a doubt, better, better overall is just yeah the outcome. Um, you learn so much so quick. So I I like to equate kind of being national chair as getting your MBA and policy degree and combination in one. You just learn so much. You get to meet so many people and do so many different things. Um, so I feel like you walk away with so many skills and then you come back and like, y'all want me to do what? Do you not understand? Like, I know how to do these different type of things. Um, I feel like it also keeps you from doing tasks that you don't need to do. Like, even though you might be talented enough to do that, if nobody asks you to do that, use your talents elsewhere when you need to use them, you know? So, um, um, time, time management is always a good thing. Um, learning when to speak and when not to speak, you know? So, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people feel like just because they have the ability to talk that they should talk and you don't always have to I'm talk. I'm still learning it. Um, <laughs> Hey, that's that's a forever lesson. I can still say I still am learning that too. But yeah, you know, you always gotta let people know you know what what it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. Unless they need to be checked, yeah, you you don't need to. No. I feel like I gotta check them all sometimes. That's my problem. <laughs> check them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's um that's some really good input. I I definitely feel like uh, Nesby taught me how to how to manage my time a lot better. I mean, shoot, just being in college in general teaches you and being, being involved in different things teaches you how to manage your time. And I realized at a certain point, I, maybe a couple of years ago, I realized I was doing, doing too much at a certain point. Um, and like you said, when you're, when you're younger and I'm saying me saying younger just makes me feel like I'm already 50 or 60. Yeah, y'all make like it sound that. like y'all so old. She's up her body <laughs> but, changing. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, there's definitely a lot that I, that I can't do now that I used to be able to do. Like, I feel like in college I was running off of, you know, four or five hours of sleep, you know, five hours of sleep, you know, going to sleep at two, waking up at seven to get ready for eight o'clock class or something like that. It was kind of like, you know, that like it is what it is and, and that's normal. And then you still go through your whole day. And then I realized I wasn't eating like as frequently as I should. Like I would, I would go like a whole day without eating sometimes. And then like eat dinner or something. And then I so said, if I did that now, mm -hmm. I'd be on a stretcher. And I've been there too. I've been there too. I've been there too. I do think though it's important to put yeah. your mental health and it in vacation time as a priority. Um, I used to do a lot for my university. Mm -hmm. I did I did so much and I remember I was sick too. I got sick too in grad school. Um, and so when I did my PhD, so when I got my master's, I got sick. So when I did my PhD, I'm like, I'm not doing that again. And so I said, tell my advisor, no. Right. So you want to come in on weekend? I'm like, no, yep. like I, I can't, I cannot. Yep. And so then when I did the postdoc, I took a break. I was like, I'm not doing any other activity. I'm just going to do this postdoc, uh, no extracurricular and apply for jobs. And now after I did my yep. first year of faculty, now I'm like, okay, I'm starting to join committees and do service. So I think it's okay to really find your balance because mm -hmm. them schools, them schools, like I just read a, a, a meme about a professor who they're still teaching from their grave. Like the school is playing videos of them teaching. You know what mm. I mean? Like them schools will use you to death, literally. And mm. then and, and yeah. you're be teaching from your grave. So I think it's so important that you put your mental health and wellness uh, as a priority. Cause, cause you are literally all you got. Right. Yeah. You are. Yeah. And, that, and I, I think honestly, um, the power of saying no, like what you're saying, like that, that is such a valuable mm -hmm. skill. And especially you start these PhD or master programs also young, you feel like you can't mm -hmm. say no because they're older than you. And it's like this mm -hmm. power shift. And once you realize you can't say no, actually that's, that's something I learned um, being around a bunch of males mm -hmm. um, in my lab. So they, they talk totally different than, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps 
I would have with my advisor. And once I said, okay, that's that's how you do it. That's what happens. Oh, okay, like this mm-hmm. this is good. But yeah, the power of saying no, like that that's great. And yeah, you don't have to join all the diversity committees and do mm-hmm. all these different things. You know, at this point, I feel as though you can choose where your gifts best lie. Yep. You know. Yes. So there's um there's two things, and and I know you you I know you gotta gotta go. We don't want to hold you for too long. Um, two things that we can kind of wrap up with. Um, just name, just speak about a time that you feel like you've been devalued um, because as a, as a black woman in, in STEM or a black woman in any industry, I feel like that can happen very easily, um, especially in engineering with the, which is a, a male driven, male dominated, you know, field um, and not even just male, uh, driven yes um, industry mm-hmm. what is the time when when has there been a time when you've been um, devalued or uh, sorry not devalued yes devalued um, and also um, are there any um, schools or universities that you plan to apply to sorry two very different questions <laughs> but I just wanted to put both of them out there Yes, so I'll start with the last question first. I feel like it's easier to answer. <laughs> so, so right now, I would say you know I'm I'm, I'm interviewing. Um, so I would not say with specific schools. You know, we'll just let let things happen the way they are. But uh, obviously, you know, interviewing. I'll say the states: states of Pennsylvania, um, North Carolina, Texas, Rhode Island, um, Boston, Boston area, Massachusetts. Um, so those those are the schools that I'm on their radar. They're on my radar. We're having conversations. I think I hear an Ivy. I think see I hear what an Ivy coming through. Uh, a couple, um, so, you know, a couple. Uh, but you know, you know, definitely research one okay. institution. So okay, we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, so I'll, I'll say that. Um, so as far as you know, being devalued. Um, I got a couple stories on that, but definitely doing electrical engineering in Pittsburgh, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. that is not used to African American mm-hmm. women. Um, that was my first lesson as a sophomore. Mm-hmm. Um, so at Pitt, your first year, you are a freshman and you have no major. You are just general engineering, and then you begin to switch over to whatever your major may be. So with me, um, switched over to electrical engineering. Most of my friends went into, I don't know, industrial engineering. N- none of the, you know, people of color came to electrical engineering with me. So uh, when it came time to study, I had to make new friends. Most of them are predominantly white males. Uh, so the difference that I had there was just a matter of, you know, just asking questions like, hey, you willing to study with me? And literally people not showing up to the time they were wow. studying. study. Dang. So the first time that it happens, you know, this is back in 2006, 2007. This is before the whole like Black Lives Matter movement. This is where we are somewhat still kumbaya knowing things happening, but then mm. also one-offs. So I'm just like, okay, um, maybe you just got the time wrong. No, it, it happens again. So the second time is just like, okay, no, you didn't get the time wrong. Like this is just yeah. you. Um, and so different instances my sophomore year, like that, that type of kind of feeling is what creates this inferiority like you know well what's what's wrong with me i'm trying to work with y'all y'all not working with me and uh received my first f ever mm. in that class you know just trying to you know make things happen so scholarship went down had whole conversations with parents like is this where you need to be is this not so you know just just that alone, the challenge is with that. And not that, you know, I didn't have people in high school that actually were of different type of descents. In high school would work in the area I was from, but coming to Southwestern PA, it wasn't used to that. So it's, it's funny that, you know, the same girl that y'all turned down sophomore year, come junior year, when I'm making A's in my class, then you want to have conversations. Then you want to study with me. <laughs> so um, that really built in me just kind of like, a do or die attitude when it came to engineering and, you know, tuck your emotions in a certain way so you can just 
do what you need to do. But also, I did not want people to experience in that department what I experienced. So that's when I became a leader on the mm-hmm. campus, right? Because I'm like, we shouldn't be going through this in 2006, 2007, 2008. We shouldn't be going through that. Um, and so trying to cultivate that space, uh, working with the minority engineering program as well, so that that, that doesn't exist. Um, so that's that's one time that I felt, you know, devalued. Um, that actually, that's that's what that song "Hide Me" by by Kirk Franklin like really you know ministered to me because I just felt like like well, what what is wrong? Like I literally have taken classes in high school. Like I should not be experiencing this. I definitely shouldn't get an F. What what is wrong? Right. You know. So just questioning those things on a variety of different level. Um, another time is just in general. Um, I would say female leadership. So working in Nesby, great opportunities, but sometimes even, you know, when I had a platform where uh, I decided that I also wanted to advocate for there being more black women in STEM and more female camps Mm -hmm. and uh, C camps. And, And what came out of that was so much pushback, so much pushback from the men. And I'm like, well, if y'all so upset, why don't y'all start these male forums? Like, what, there, there is nothing wrong with you also doing it. But if I chose to do this, and I am someone that clearly, not that a black man could not do it, but as a black woman that has gone through this process of understanding why and specifically where we need to target to have more African-American women go into engineering, right. here's what I want to speak on. Oh man, I was like almost seen as demonic in some ways. It's like, oh, she's a feminist. I'm like, I'm a feminist, you know. <laughs> so learn different things. So you know, I, I I was not expecting at that time for female leadership to not be looked um, at, kind of like in a place that we're we're not equal, even in an organization where skin color we look, mm-hmm. you know, similar. Um, and so, you know, just having those conversations, working with other organizations like Society of Women Engineers and just speaking to why we still, even within SWE, needed to work on having African-American women um, focus because even within SWE, mm-hmm. you know, African-American women isn't, or women of color isn't the top. You know, so that started to change conversations within that organization as well. Um, so I would say that those instances were learning lessons, but it's just more so a way of learning how to work within this world. You know, nobody is going to give you a kind of right hand of passage to say, like, this is what you need to do to get it done and this will work. We know for people of color, it's going to be even harder for us. So just understanding that and also learning that through my experiences, I can teach somebody who's coming after me to have a better way. You know, I'm not saying your way is going to be perfect, but here are some of the things that you need to get done and always get back. And so my mentors have taught me that. Um, they've been ones that have always given back to me when they didn't have to. And I'm appreciative of that. And one thing that they ask is you just pay it forward. So, you know, that's wow. what I try to do. Wow. That's that was, awesome. that, she, you dropped a bunch of jewels in that. And, uh, yeah, that was good. That was good. That was, well, we, uh, we really appreciate you stopping by. Um, yes. I feel like you're like a, a celebrity of the, of the STEM world. So I, uh, um, I definitely appreciate you taking the time out to do this with us. Um, if you want to, you can, you, you don't have to, but um, if you want to uh, give your social media platforms or anything like that, or uh, any, anything you want to shout out, you can go on ahead and do so now. And then we'll, we'll throw out our social media handles after that. So. Sure. Um, first, I want to say I really appreciate this opportunity. I love what you all are trying to do and get out there. So when James called me in to say, hey, like, this is what I really want to happen. Um, I'm like, yeah, I'm for it. I always want to, you know, put our self on for the culture, you know, so whenever I can promote what we're doing, it is good. I'm for it. So I, I say that for y'all, even if y'all have something else going on, like I'd love to support it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I am at light up the fire. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, my first name, Cecina Wood. That's Facebook. I don't use Facebook as much anymore, but you can find me on there. Uh, Instagram is Cecina24. Uh, LinkedIn is Cecina Wood. So follow me there. Um, also, I just want to share uh, that I do happen to have 
uh, organization that I'm putting together with a few colleagues of mine. We're doing uh, black merchandise and black apparel. Um, that's you know by a black design company. So we are called the Black Collection. Spelled uh, our handle is T H E B L K C L T N. The Black Collection, um, and we're just working on you know a lot of hoodies um, at the time, you know T-shirts, what have you. This has nice melanin that's drip. Right. So check it out. The, the website is a uh, yep, it's the <laughs> drip. So our website is B L K C L T N. Dot Spirit Cell. Dot Com. That's where you can uh, see any of our type of apparel and uh just because we're on here today we're going to drop that promo code that's oh, going to be live for black history month yeah so for your for your listeners it's blk21 so that's black 21 like 21 21 but don't put 21 21 just put blk21 um so definitely check us out um we're also trying to do custom orders as well so if there's something that you all feel you want some nice strip or apparel uh, we could print it out. Doesn't matter if it's right now, just like you know, clothing or later cups, stickers. You know, we'll be slowly evolving that. So just follow us. Um, but again, I appreciate the opportunity to engage with you all, and I'm looking forward to discussions forward. We appreciate that. We appreciate that, um, Matt and Shar. I'll let you all go on ahead and throw out your social media information. Uh, okay. okay. Shar, go ahead. Okay. Um, Ladies first. I just want to say you deserve everything that's good that's coming your way. I'm so happy that you joined us on this conversation. I know you're going to do great things. Um, I'm really just mainly on Instagram. So just uh, Dr. Shar H. Um, I already followed you too. But uh, Dr. Yeah, H. Dr. Shar H. Yep. Uh, I just want to read what she said. James is not lying on the intro. Uh, yeah, super profound. You're doing big things, so looking forward to following you and see what you do next. Um, Matt Diggs, Instagram, get digging with it. My art page, Urban Diggs Art. You can follow me there. Cool, cool. And yes, thank you again for, for stopping by. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, we got to give give people their flowers while they're here to smell them. Um, That's right. So, so thank you. Um, you can follow me on Instagram jlens underscore ent that's j l i n z underscore ent um you can follow our full podcast um at full underscore steam like s-t-e-a-m underscore ahead uh so check us out and you know click the follow button and follow that so thank you this is a another great episode we appreciate your time thanks y'all Thank you. Peace. New draft official.